In the depths of the Amazon rainforest, a Waodani hunter stalks his prey, as his ancestors have done for hundreds of years. His blowgun poised, a quiver of poison darts close at hand. He gazes into the densely interwoven layer of branches that forms the canopy. Ten stories above the forest floor, an unsuspecting woolly monkey searches for food. quickly prepares a poison dart while carefully watching his prey above. Deadly accuracy, the final dart pierces the monkey's heart, and soon its struggles cease. Armed with primitive weapons, the Waodani hunter relies on extraordinary skill and cunning to harvest the bounty of the forest. His knowledge of the jungle and its creatures is legendary. <laughs> the canopy of the rainforest harbors an abundance of life. A squirrel monkey enjoys a succulent leaf. While the marmoset attentively grooms its mate, and a scarlet macaw feeds on berries. The secrets of the Waodani's beliefs, traditions, and nomadic existence have, until recently, remained a mystery to the outside world. The Waodani are an ancient tribe, having no form of writing nor any clearly defined history. In their society, there are no leaders, no chiefs. Men and women's roles are considered equal. And yet, as their Stone Age lifestyle is being revealed to us for the first time, we are discovering that their lives are filled with paradox. <laughs> Taught to function effectively as individuals, they demonstrate an extraordinary sense of cooperation. And while historically hostile to those outside the family group, life within it is peaceful and harmonious. Children are gently accorded the same freedoms as adults and are encouraged to participate in the important rituals of the tribe. As one of the few remaining Stone Age cultures in the world, the Waodani represent a unique living link to our distant past. Covering much of the South American continent, the Amazon basin contains the largest rainforest in the world, blanketing over two million square miles. In Ecuador, near the headwaters of the Amazon, the small Waodani tribe can be found. Their traditional territory, covering more than 8,000 square miles, is bordered in the north by the Napo River and in the south by the Kurarai.
For centuries, the Waodani have fiercely defended their hunting grounds from the Quechua and the Saparoan tribes of the surrounding jungles. And they were hostile to any attempts at intrusion from the outside world. They were referred to by all who knew them as Aukas, or savages. In 1956, their isolation was broken. Five American missionaries flew deep into Waodani territory, hoping to make peaceful contact with them. On Tuesday, January 3rd, they landed on the banks of the Kurarai River. Within a few days, three Indians emerged from the undergrowth, a man and two women. After exchanging some gifts, they sat down together and had lively conversations without understanding one another at all. The encounter, which appeared friendly at first, suddenly ended in tragedy. All five missionaries were brutally slain by Alka Spears. Their camera, recovered from the scene, recorded the last pictures taken before the missionaries' deaths. In the years following, hostility slowly waned. Two Waodani women were taken in by missionaries who learned from them elements of their unique language. Tenuous friendships were formed and trade goods exchanged. Waodani fears and suspicions gradually disappeared. They were given metal pots, beads and clothing and eventually their lifestyle changed as they learned to adapt to the ways of the modern world. By the late 1960s, most of the 500 Wadani were moved to a small tribal settlement in the jungle established for them by the government as a protectorate. But in the remote jungles to the east are to be found the widely scattered villages of a few families who continue to live their lives as nomadic hunter-gardeners. Yet even their isolation is coming to an end. Road builders have come within 50 miles of their homes. Commercial hunters are depleting the game. Oil workers are invading their jungles. And casual tourists with the common cold often bring pneumonia and death. Explorer Grant Berman, realizing that the Waodane Stone Age lifestyle would soon vanish, organized and led an expedition to film their ancient culture before it disappeared. Dr. Robert Carniero, a renowned authority on Amazonia, collaborated with the expedition in the collection of artifacts and film for the American Museum of Natural History. Dr. James Yost, anthropologist from the Summer Institute of Linguistics, has lived with his family amongst the Waodani for the last 10 years. As the world's foremost authority on their culture, he guided the expedition into the remote jungles where the isolated groups can still be found. Flying over the vast, unbroken rainforest beyond the foothills of the Andes, the expedition searched for signs of the widely scattered Waodani settlements. Finally, they spotted a tiny clearing, a small jungle garden, the temporary village of Awankado, where one nomadic family lives in a single thatched hut. The Waodani are linguistically unique. Their language bears no known relationship to any other in the world. As one of the few outsiders who speaks their language, Dr. Yost was able to record the genealogies of five Waodani generations. Dr. Yost recalls, It was not until I began to collect their life histories that I realized how thoroughly violence had permeated Waodani life. They weren't just hostile to outsiders. They had also been incredibly hostile to each other. 
I learned that over a period of five generations, fully 70% of Waodani males had been killed in spearing raids. Kampati was the oldest male in Awankato. When I interviewed him, he recalled that when he was a young man, every adult male kept his hardwood spears sharpened and ready, not just to hunt game, but to raid neighboring villages. At an early age, boys were encouraged to be aggressive and to play spearing games with termite nests. Enacting family feuds, they impaled imaginary enemies targeted for revenge. When the boys grew up, deadly skill with spears would become a chief asset of Waodani manhood. A fierce pet harpy eagle was often tethered nearby. With its acute hearing, it served as a sentry and would scream a warning at the stealthy approach of enemies. Spearing raids have been a brutal reality in Waodani life. The family histories were filled with terrifying memories. It was not until the Waodani understood the message brought by the missionaries that they were able to cease hostilities. Sporadic contact with those living in the protectorate convinced the Waodani still scattered throughout the jungle that indeed the reign of terror had ended. Today, the era of revenge killings is over, and the Waodani use their spears to hunt Uda, peccary, the elusive wild boar of the forest. Nyama's success in the forest today has brought in 60 pounds of meat and it will be shared equally tonight by everyone in the village. The four related families, each with a cooking fire in the corner of the hut, live in close harmony. The meat from the hunt is divided among all the members of the Nanikabo, the extended family. Everyone gets a share. To the Waodani, sharing with their kin is the most important value in family life. To them it means, I care for you, and I want you to survive. Waodani men enjoy no special status in the family. There is no family hierarchy. While Nyama's success in hunting has fed the family well today, Campetti was not as fortunate. He captivates the family with a story. <laughs> To the Waodani, Minyi, the jaguar, is the most powerful and respected jungle predator. But to Kampedi, it is also a mysterious spiritual force, Bagai, the haunting embodiment of a dead ancestor. 
As dusk approaches, families gather together in front of the thatched longhouse to groom each other, removing jungle insects acquired during the day's activities. A simple necessity of jungle living becomes for the Waodani a warm and welcome family ritual, symbolizing mutual dependence and anticipated with pleasure by all at the end of each day. As darkness slowly envelops the surrounding forest and the sounds of the jungle come alive, small fires crackle into the night. Waka reflects on the adventures of her day, while Minyemu repeats an ancient chant. Her songs inspire hope for a fruitful harvest. As they grow up, young children have few responsibilities, but if they own a pet, they are expected to care for it. Meepo arrives early each morning with meat for his pet harpy eagle. The voracious harpy keeps Meepo busy. It is he who must hunt for the eagle's food. The children grow up with no formal education. Learning is spontaneous and unstructured. The wide variety of pets kept in the village provide the children with practical lessons in wildlife. From close association with pets, they learn the calls of many creatures found in the rainforest. The children's senses will become so acute that eventually they will be able to detect some species from the smell of urine dripping on the leaves up to 40 feet away in the jungle. Young boys of 8 or 10 are often allowed to borrow their father's full-size blowgun to go hunting in the forest nearby. Their frequent forays into the jungle test and strengthen their bodies and sharpen their eyes and ears. Meepo imitates an ant wren with the hope of luring it close enough for a shot. The boys share the use of the blowgun. Competition is completely foreign to them. Spontaneous cooperation is the only way they know.
For Awa and Meepo, hunting is a joyful preparation for the serious responsibilities of manhood. Although the boys manage to bring home only one small bird, it will be accepted by their grandmother, Minyimu, as a significant contribution to the cooking pot. It is a symbol of their willingness to share. The woman's role in Waodani life, though different from the man's, is accorded equal status. The growing, gathering and preparation of jungle crops is considered as important as bringing meat home from the hunt. Girls learn their role in family life by example from their mothers. Like all young girls, Weka learns the utilitarian crafts of home life informally from watching and helping older women. As her aunt, Awama, assists, she practices weaving a string bag. All Waodani life revolves around such kinship interdependence. From the dried fronds of the Chambira, competitive actors. He showed me how he and his father used the sharpened bone of a peccary to gouge out a handle for a stone axe. The Waodani made handles for stone axes, but they did not fashion stone blades. These they found on the jungle floor, left behind by other cultures. When they found stone axes in the jungle, the Waodani did not even associate them with man, but believed them to have been made by Wang Ongi, the creator. Campati carried the stone axe into his garden to demonstrate how effective it had been. Using deliberate, evenly paced strokes, he patiently chopped for almost an hour to cut down one small tree. Felling the forest giants must have been incredibly strenuous work with these meager tools. And yet, the Waurani have no word for work. To Campati, it is just Awengi. Awengi, Awengi, chopping, chopping, chopping. Today, the steel axe is one of the few modern implements Campetti's people have acquired from the outside world, and like a magnet, it is pulling them into the modern age. While men chop trees, it is the women who understand the complicated task of gardening. To plant, cultivate, and harvest the riches of the forest floor is considered an art. When asked if men ever do gardening, Mima laughed. Men? They could never do it right. They'd ruin it. They only know how to chop. Awengi, awengi, awengi.
The basic crop of the Waudani garden is manioc, a starchy jungle root. It is part of almost every meal. As the manioc slowly matures, other plants are intercropped in the garden. Peanuts, corn, plantains, sweet potatoes, and yam beans. Thus the Waudani managed to extract a wide variety of crops from a single garden, with a harvest of manioc as their favorite reward. Manioc does not grow from seed. So, as the women harvest the tubers, they also gather the stalks for later planting. But the rainforest grows on a thin layer of impoverished soil. Since most of the nutrients are held in the living vegetation, the soil will support only a few harvests. So the Waudani plant a series of gardens, carefully scheduled to mature in sequence. The cycle of planting and harvesting, abandoning the old gardens and moving on to the new, is continuous. At Dewey Tumi, a day's journey from Awankado, Competi's family are planting the garden of their future jungle home. The men leave the large trees standing to shade the women from working in the blazing sun, to protect the soil from the sun and frequent torrential rains. The leaf litter is left undisturbed. When the planting is completed, the last trees are felled. The garden crops, like meat from the hunt, may be shared by the Waudani, but the women of each family prepare meals separately at their individual cooking fires. The jungle supports them well. The fruit of the chonta palm is one of the most prized delicacies of Waudani diet. The towering trees bear fruit only once a year, and except for Waudani ingenuity, it would be out of reach. Rings of spiky thorns guard the chonta. The trees are impossible to climb. In order to get at the fruit, Titikawa makes a climbing ring from twisted jungle vines and uses it as a brace to ascend a smooth bark cecropia tree growing amidst the thorny chonta. The conveniently located climbing tree did not grow beside the fruiting palms by chance. It was planted there by Titikawa years before. The jungle fruit is so valued by the Waudani that every chanta in the surrounding forest has been claimed. The chanta thus becomes a part of the village kinship system and the jungle itself a Waudani garden. As he gathers fruit from his chonta palm, Titikawa proudly claims ownership. Voto da Ganga, my tree. But its fruit will be shared with the entire village in the traditional Waudani way. The wood of the chanta palm, as well as its fruit, plays a central role in Waudani life. 
The hard trunk is used to make the hunter's most prized possession, his blowgun. Competti starts by splitting off two matching sections of Chanta palm. There are no specialists in Wadani society. Each individual is expected to make his own hunting weapons. When the tribe relied on stone implements, making a blowgun took more than two months to complete. Now, with metal blades, it takes only two weeks. Competti shaves one side of each section flat to form a bonding surface. Chanta staves are softened by heating them carefully over a fire. Using the notch of a tree stump, Competti gently applies pressure to straighten the warm and supple wood. Darts for blowgun hunting are shaved needle sharp from the stems of Chambira palm. Dozens of darts might be expended in a single hunt, so the men of the village spend much of their spare time shaving the slim projectiles. The twin halves of the blowgun are each grooved separately with a broken machete blade. Competti cuts patiently, aligning a narrow groove by eye. Each groove must be perfectly straight and perfectly matched to its mate. Watching his grandfather make a new blowgun is part of Mipu's education. By the time he is 14, he will know how to make his own. A long strip of bark is peeled from a length of jungle vine in order to tightly wrap the finished halves together. After beeswax has been applied to form an airtight seal, the entire length of the blowgun is securely wrapped. Using water as a lubricant and ever finer grades of sand and clay as an abrasive, Competti reams the bore of his blowgun and polishes it to a fine sheen. His attention to detail is meticulous. After a full week of polishing, the bore will be as smooth as that of a fine shotgun. Unlike other Amazon tribes that have developed snares and traps of many kinds, the Waodani relies solely on spears and the blowgun to harvest the bounty of the forest. Far off in the shadowy rainforest, Awa climbs a liana to collect the raw materials needed to make curare poison. His uncle, Tidikawa, spotted this special vine a month ago while on a hunt.
The acrid resins in the shavings are the only active ingredients in curare. How the Indians discovered its deadly effects is a mystery. Even concentrated curare becomes deadly only if it enters the bloodstream. Yet it has been used in blowgunning for hundreds of years. Titikawa says the Waodani have used it, kui, forever. The top of the bundle of palm is chopped off and becomes a funnel. When water is poured through the shavings, it leaches out the resins, and the funnel becomes a poison percolator. Without this poison for the darts, the blowgun would be rendered ineffective. The liquid is then heated to a boil, thickened and concentrated. The sticky black lacquer is spread on a fragile clay pot that has been used to cook monkey meat. The Waodani believe that darts treated in this way will better seek out their prey. This ritual is an integral part of Waodani belief. Titikawa hopes to enhance the poison's strength by singing a hunting song. In the early light of day, predators scour the forest for food. A harpy eagle clutching a woolly monkey in its talons skims over the towering trees of the rainforest as it wings its way back to its nest. The harpy is a competitor of the Waodani for birds and monkeys. Like the Waodani, a harpy requires vast hunting grounds to survive. The lush and humid upper layer of the snake-infested rainforest is the bountiful hunting ground of the Waodani.
Far from the village, Campetti stalks silently through the dense undergrowth, peering into the canopy far above in search of monkeys. Although the jungle abounds with creatures, they are almost always hidden from view. An emerald tree boa lurks ominously overhead. His blowgun at the ready, Campetti pauses to imitate a bird. Because the Araceri is busily feeding on berries, Campetti is unable to lure it close enough for a shot. So he moves on silently, deeper into the jungle. Disturbed by a movement, a deadly coral snake emerges from underneath the leaf litter to investigate. As Campetti proceeds deeper into the forest, he stops intermittently to call in howler monkeys. From high in the canopy comes a reply. On today's hunt, Campetti's seven-year-old grandson, Awa, has come along to help. In the canopy, almost 120 feet above the jungle floor, the shadowy forms of two howlers come into view. Campetti prepares a poison dart and notches it with the razor-sharp teeth of a piranha jaw. If the monkey tries to pull out the dart, the poison tip will break off, remaining in the wound to do its deadly work. Campetti must act quickly or the monkey will flee. A single leaf deflects the dart, and he must try again. A hit, but one dart is not enough for a 20-pound howler. Awa and Campetti must now pursue the wounded monkey as it flees through the canopy more than ten stories above. The pursuit will take them over a distance of several miles, and in the ensuing three-hour chase, Campetti will expend almost 30 darts. Partially paralyzed, the howler takes refuge in the fork of a tree. In this crucial phase of the hunt, Awa learns to provide essential help. By now the monkey has been hit three times. It is beginning to slow down and is easier to follow. Trying to get a final shot, Campetti attempts to scare the monkey into view.
Shut! Shut! Two more shots and a final hit. The dying monkey, almost completely immobilized, still clings stubbornly to the branches above. Campetti, almost 60 years old, must now climb 100 feet into the canopy to retrieve his dying prey. Leaving the relative safety of the jungle floor, he enters the monkey's own environment to try to bring it down. Hey. The howler, by now unconscious, is wedged between two branches and Campetti must precariously cross over to its refuge to dislodge it. On today's hunt, Campetti has had to climb 11 trees, each over 100 feet tall, all for just one 20-pound monkey. Before starting the long journey home, Campetti takes a dart from his quiver and silently marks the trail. Perhaps another hunter who passes here will be as lucky as he. Campetti, wearily returning home with his meager reward, tells Awa that the monkeys are getting scarce. We had to go too far today. Perhaps it is time to move on to a new place. To do it to me. Campetti's monkey will be cooked and shared by all members of the household. Other hunters have returned tonight with no meat at all. The portions will be small, but everyone will get a reassuring share. The game is becoming scarce, and the soil of the village gardens has been flooded by torrential rains. It is time to gather in the final harvest and to leave, to seek the abundance of the forest elsewhere. Before he leaves, Campetti ritually sets fire to his house. 
as his ancestors have done for thousands of years. It has been a center of family life for an abundant season of hunting and harvest. But the house is temporary. As with most of their possessions, it is easily replaced. Ampeti's family have already begun their journey to Dewey Tumi, where they will build anew. As Campetti prepares to leave, he anticipates his future hunting ground, confident that game will be there. He understands the fragile balance of life in the rainforest and expects his nomadic ways to assure a continuous supply of food. The rainforest is the Waudani's home, upon which their very lives depend. But the resources of the jungle are being exploited by the modern world. Rainforests are disappearing at an alarming rate. By the time Campetti's family completes the day's journey to their new jungle home, some 10,000 acres of Amazon rainforest will have been destroyed. As the towering giants fall, the game will disappear, and Campetti's world will be in peril. Unless we can reverse this destruction, the traditional Waudani way of life will be extinguished forever, and the rainforests will echo with silence. <laughs>